Well, hopefully a lot of you have had a chance to see our patient who is upstairs, but um, our patient is actually joining us here at Grand Rounds right now. So thank you very much for coming and taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us and you know, kind of be a part of this learning experience. Um, so first presentation, presentation is by Dr. Barlow, Persistent Positive Dyspatopsia After ICL Surgery for High Myopia. Good morning, everybody. So this uh, uh, case uh, is, uh, as you can see, after ICL surgery and persistent uh, dysphotopsia. Dysphotopsia, of course, is not uh, unique to the ICL. It's something that we're all familiar with, with uh, aphakic intraocular lenses for cataract surgery, but uh, also see it in other optical systems, whether it be glasses, contact lenses, uh, where optical systems are used to image, uh, such as a telescope or microscope. Uh, this is an issue that we see with, with any form of lens. and so. I mean, it's not unique to this, this specific lens. Uh, just a brief clinical history for those who didn't get a chance to, to see the patient. Uh, he's a 28-year-old young man, very healthy uh, eye exam. He had a stable high myopia at his initial refractive consultations. He's spherical equivalent, about minus eight. He uh, had normal topography and pentacam, but thinner corneas, and thus, uh, given his higher correction, laser vision correction surgery is not felt to be the best option for him. Uh, you can see his pupils fairly uh, normal in terms of a little bit larger pupil for a young, young gentleman. Uh, other measurements that are specific to the ICL, good endothelial cell count and deep anterior chamber in both eyes. Now, surgically, everything went very smoothly. He had uh, his peripheral iridotomies placed two weeks prior uh, to the ICL implantation, uh, times two superiorly. Uh, in his ICL surgery, you can see the uh, powers and size of the lens there performed June 1st of uh, last year. Uh, the size was determined using sulcus to sulcus measurements and nomograms that have been published uh, with that. There were no complications with his surgery. Uh, his post-operative course, uh, first uh, post-operative visit, you can see uncorrected vision is very good at 2020 and 2015. Pressure is normal. His ICL vault is uh, about as ideal as, uh, as uh, you can get there, uh, just under 500 microns. His one-month visit is where uh, the issues started to present themselves. You see his vision is good, uh, pressure and lamp exam unremarkable. Minimal uh, refractive error uh, left over there. But he was starting to notice problems with uh, night vision with glare and halo effect and unwanted visual symptoms, some of which uh, sounded like they might be attributable to his PI with specific point light sources at specific angles. Uh, he asked about the possibility of removal of the ICL and closure of the PI if these symptoms do not improve. Of course, uh, encouraged him to give it a little more time. Uh, as we know, many times patients do improve with uh, we call neural adaptation over time. At his three-month post-op visit, uh, no significant change in terms of the exam or symptoms. And uh, most recently here, uh, earlier uh, this month, a six-month post-op visit, vision still doing very well, so lamp exam unchanged. Uh, I repeated his manifest refraction. Again, no significant refractive error. Still having the symptoms, noticing some subtle improvements uh, with PRN use of alpha-GAN and maybe some softening to, uh, to a modest degree. Uh, we discussed uh, a trial of alpha again three times daily to see if we could improve his uh, adaptation um, uh, to these symptoms, hopefully reduce them at least temporarily and allow him to adapt. And then, uh, of course, a presentation at Grand Rounds to give him a chance to meet some of our other uh, refractive surgeons, get uh, further input on his case. I just wanted to do just a brief overview. Uh, there's not a lot in the scientific literature on this specific issue. Um, this uh, specific issue, of course, glare and halo with any type of intraocular lens, we know with time tends to improve, thought due to neural adaptation, the brain's ability to soften the effects of unwanted visual phenomena and focus on uh, the information that's important to visual processing. Uh, you know, what results in poor adaptation? These may be more rhetorical questions. Uh, if anybody knows the answer, please uh, pipe up and, and let us know. Uh, you know. Poor adaptation may be personality related, uh, you know, based on some literature if we look at IOLs, uh, but uh, not a lot of great answers to that question. Uh, how can we redirect those that are not adapting well? Not a lot of great treatments. Alpha-GAN, of course, used for night vision symptoms. Uh, you know, others like negative dysphotopsy can be corrected with uh, you know, solid uh, glasses with uh, frames that uh, cover that uh, shadow effect that we see with uh, aphagic IOLs. Um, looking at some of the literature uh, specific to the ICL and, and glare and halo, 
Uh, not a lot to specific to that, but several that do at least address it uh, as a secondary outcome measure. Uh, this uh, study was a quality of life study published in ophthalmology in 2010 as a pr prospective case series. So you see 34 total patients. Their man, main outcome was the QIRC score. And you see pre-op and post-op, there was an improvement uh, that was statistically significant, so quality of life overall was improved. Um, most of the items on that uh, questionnaire were significant improvements. Specific to uh, the difficulty with driving and glare conditions, there was no significant difference. It wasn't, wasn't worse or better uh, after the procedure. Uh, there were seven patients that initially noted, about 20% 20, 20 of patients initially noted glare, halo, or starburst. Uh, the questionnaire was administered about three to four months post-op. All of them had noted some subjective improvement uh, in those symptoms. So another paper here, uh, this was actually an abstract from ARVO, uh, risk factors associated with glare and halo. Uh, this particular uh, cohort had a, a higher percentage of glare and halo. Uh, I can see there are 55 eyes of 30 patients. It's 12-month post-op assessment, uh, chart review with questionnaire for those patients. Uh, the incidence of glare, you can see 40% uh, uh, halo and glare, although the severe incidence was a little bit lower about 15%. A halo correlated with pupil size, and you see the correlation coefficient 0 0.25, not a strong correlation, but there is some positive correlation. Uh, severity only correlated to the actual ICL power, and with multivariate analysis, the ICL size was the only factor using a cutoff of 12, essentially cutting off to the smallest size that affected that. Uh, with glare symptoms, they were not able to find any statistically significant association with specific factors uh, as a causative feature for glare. This is a Canadian study, CJO, just very recently published in 2017. It's a ret retrospective case series uh, looking at their outcomes in general, uh, looking specifically at our interest. The adverse event glare and halo was reported in six eyes, 7.9%. They did not categorize it in terms of severity uh, or discuss uh, treatments uh, uh, other than uh, the expectation that over time these symptoms would improve. This is a study looking at different reasons for explantation of a, an ICL present at the King Khaled Eye Specialist Hospital in Saudi Arabia. It's a retrospective chart review. You can see uh, they performed just under 800 ICL implants, only had to remove 30 of them, so about 3.8% removal. Most of them due to sizing issues, uh, you know, the cataract, high residual astigmatism, one retinal detachment. And, only one patient that had the ICL removed for intolerable glare. So uh, you know, consistent with what uh, we typically see clinically and what is felt to be uh, an issue that tends to improve the so glare, uh, not typically being a strong cause or reason for ICL explantation. Looking at the original FDA approval study, this uh, study actually has a little more detailed information. Uh, this was published in 2004. It was three-year safety and efficacy data. You see a large cohort, 526 eyes, 294 patients. Uh, you see satisfaction rates overall very, very good. Uh, specific to glare and halo, you can see that most patients did not notice significant changes pre and post-op, about 80% in that category. Improving by one or two categories on their questionnaire or worsening by one or two categories, you can see very small numbers. Uh, in terms of improving or worsening, and then one category change, about 10% in each group there with glare and halo, about 5 to 5 to 8% there. So uh, most patients, again, do not notice significant differences pre and post. Uh, so that's a review of the literature that I could find specific to this issue. Uh, in general, the, the overall uh, you know, points that are made in these studies, uh, with time, these symptoms tend to improve. Uh, and when we compare this to other refractive procedures, PRK and LASIK, uh, uh, the glare and halo numbers seem to corroborate uh, or are similar, uh, and the, the experiences, they tend to improve over time. Uh, for those patients with persistent dysphotopsy, sometimes it can be a little bit challenging uh, in terms of treatment options. Does anybody have any experience that they could share uh, or thoughts on this specific clinical case uh, regarding his symptoms and treatments that you might suggest that could be helpful. Roger? Have you considered low-dose pyrocarpine? you get a bit more pupil restriction than you would have? I uh, haven't considered that yet, but certainly that would be an option. Obviously, we're using alpha with a similar sort of thought process behind it to try and 
blunt pupil dilation, particularly in mesopic circumstances, but I yeah, haven't thought, that, thought about that just yet. Mark and Amy? Okay. As we, many of us know who do a lot of eye surgery, but we make PIs, those are little holes in the eyes. Um, it's a really, it can be kind of a confusing um, geometry of what's actually happening because in his case, on his right eye in particular, I mean, those PIs are tiny, they're, depth, they're covered by the limbal vascular. So there's light being reflected from the inside of the eye. Right. And so, um, and we talked about this upstairs, even, you know, the literature is kind of all over the place as to where the best place to put a PI is. I have an anecdotal experience of a patient who was being prepared for uh, ICL at another center, a very reputable place by a reputable surgeon. And he came in just completely freaked out after the PIs were performed and didn't actually go in and the surgery. So we know that can cause um, issues. Having said that, I've had my own patients with well-placed PIs that have done really well with alpha GAN and just encouragement. You know, I think knowing that it's okay and kind of you know, explaining what's going on, and generally people can adapt to it. But I do think constricting the people a little bit helps just because it lets less, 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 less light in. I know Amy's going to make an interesting Yes, I haven't actually done this, but um, I guess for you to know where that glare is coming from, is it coming from like the PIs themselves or something else, is trying to you know, cover up the PIs, not mm -hmm. surgically, but you can take apparently like a permanent marker, like a Sharpie, and color on the cornea over the PIs and see if that cuts down on glare and halos. Okay. Yeah, we try and then if it does, maybe you could consider like cosmetic contact lens as the next step. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's maybe a plain of <coughs> tinted contact lens just to see if that would block the PI. To see if the PI is more likely the source versus the, like the lens Mark itself. Said, if it's coming, if it's reflecting off the inside of the eye, I don't know how you, how you okay. block, block the PI somehow. Just to try. Thank you. Nick? The difficult thing with this photops is in a fake IOL is we still don't know the etiology. And I know that, that you know, the PI is certainly something that's going to add to it. The PI is not something we have in pseudophagic dysphotopsis. So, I mean, I think the mechanisms in pseudophagic dysphotopsis, people have looked at many of the different etiologies, IOL material, edge design, relationship to the capsule on the edge, depth of the chamber, all of those are involved. What's interesting is in pseudophagic dysphotopsis, the pupil doesn't do anything. And, and, you know, you would think that it would because it would take away any issues but to be honest, it doesn't. Yeah. Whereas in, in someone who is still uh, faking and, and having dysphotopsy is, if it's not related to the PI itself, I have real difficulty coming up with an etiologic mechanism because the crystalline lens is still intact. You don't have the, you know, the interface with the lens and the capsule bag to worry about it. So if it's not coming from the PIs, I still don't know exactly what the etiology would be in a Phagic yeah, it's difficult because it's in the sulcus, which is the position for a pseudophagic that you would want to move yeah, the lens, lens to. Still there, so you're not having yeah. interactions, you're not having the change in the depth of the chamber, and so yeah. uh, you know you've got to really look seriously at the PI as, as a potential source. Okay. I just have Mark. another comment, just in general for patients with nighttime vision symptoms, whether it's a refractive surgery, cataract patient, whatever. Is just making sure to separate out the component of untreated refractive error. Because yes. Now, even a little bit of a stigmatism, if they have a bigger pupil, that's going to cause some quote glare or halo or whatever. We know that uh, young patients in particular may be a little bit more myopic later in the day, et cetera. So just being able to separate that out is important. Yes, I agree. Any other comments? Thank you.